Hello, welcome to Chem 327's Introduction to Electron Microscopy. Today we are going to go over the basic theory and experimental practices needed when getting an SEM image. Electron microscopy is split into two general fields, transmission electron microscopy, or TEM, or scanning electron microscopy, SEM. Both are similar in that they use electrons instead of optical light in order to generate an image. However, the location of the detectors varies greatly between the two techniques. In transmission electron microscopy, the electrons penetrate and travel through a sample onto a detector, where in scanning electron microscopy, the electrons are scattered off of the sample and go upwards towards a detector. A key factor in determining what an electron microscope image will look like is the accelerating voltage of the electrons. The accelerating voltage is set by the user and can vary between 1 and 200 kilovolts. The high end, anything above 30 kilovolts, but normally 200 kilovolts, is used in TEM and can resolve uh, discrepancies in crystal lattices, which gives you powerful crystal information. Lower energies, the 1 to 30 kilovolt range, is used primarily in scanning electron microscopy. The higher an electron's accelerating voltage is, the more deeply it is able to penetrate through matter. That is why the high energies are used to penetrate completely through, in the case of transmission electron microscopy. In SEM, however, there is a little bit of an art when it comes to figuring out what accelerating voltage is best. The lower voltage, 1 kilovolt, are very surface sensitive. However, do not have excellent resolving power. The higher values for SEM, the 10 to 30 kilovolt range, are not quite as surface specific, but have much finer resolution. The change in resolving power is what separates electron microscopy and optical microscopy. A term you may have come across in your other courses is diffraction limited microscopy. This is a known issue when trying to probe the nano regime because light, or any probe really, is strongly scattered when its wavelength is on the same order of magnitude as the sample. As visible light is in the 400 to 700 nanometer range, it cannot resolve features smaller than this. Electrons, however, have a wavelength roughly that of an angstrom, depending on the accelerating voltage, and can provide much higher resolution. SEM is used to generate images in multiple scientific fields, including chemistry, material science, and entomology. As any form of microscopy, sample preparation is key to getting a good image in SEM. Our lab mainly focuses on studying nanomaterials, so I'm going to quickly prepare some carbon nitride, a known semiconducting photocatalyst, and try to get some SEM images. For an SEM measurement, you want to use as little sample as possible to get a good image. So I'm going to take some of my freshly prepared carbon nitride and scoop it into a small vial for preparation. Next, I'm going to ensure it's properly vortexed and put it in the sonicator for a few minutes. Sonication helps break up aggregations in the nanomaterials and can better prepare them for the dilution step. Now this part is a bit more of an art than a science, but this is very cloudy and there would be too many particles when we tried to take a picture on the instrument. So I'm going to serially dilute it in half each time until there's a concentration visually that I'm happy with. we've obtained a reasonable concentration, we're going to place our sample onto the grid, which will go into the instrument. A very small amount of sample, not more than three microliters, is required. And now we wait. And after we've let that dry, we're ready to go and take our first images. The electron microscopy facility in Lash Miller is located in the basement. If you head down the elevators and exit to your left, it is in a wooden hallway about halfway down the main hallway. It's known as the Center for Nanostructure Imaging, or CNI, and inside are several different electron microscopes. The first one, and the one we'll be using today, is an HRSEM, high resolution SEM, capable of delivering high resolving power. There is also an HRTEM, 
an ESEM or environmental SEM, as well as several other weaker TEMs and SEMs. Let's go over this brief PowerPoint slide to see the instrumentation. So the first thing you have is an electron gun. It's normally a tungsten filament and it is electrically powered to emit a series of electrons with the same voltage, acceler accelerating voltage in a downward direction. These electrons form a beam which passes through a condenser lens which focuses it. An aperture is in place in almost every instrument, similarly to optical microscopy, to help eliminate excess electrons to not overpower the signal. An objective lens helps focus the initial beam onto your specific spot. You control what the objective does using um, a coarse or a fine focusing tool. Um, number five there is the grid. I'm going to touch on that in a second. But on the grid is your sample. So as the electrons hit your sample, they are scattered in multiple different directions. And a scattering electron microscope, also known as a scanning electron microscope, will have several detectors located above your sample that will pick up the electrons and generate an image. While this setup is pretty simple, you can imagine that this instrumentation is not cheap and was not easy to make in the first place. That's because concentrating a beam of electrons and collecting a scattered signal and generating an image is more complicated than it would sound. So the first issue that comes up is that you need a very high vacuum in order to keep the electron beam stable. As we discussed earlier, particles will scatter off of things that they are roughly the same size of. And since an electron is on the order of an angstrom or so, um, that puts it on the same scale as most atoms. And if you had a non-vacuum situation, if there was air present, the water vapor and the molecules in the air would scatter the light scatter the electrons, I should say, in various different directions and they would never make it to your sample. There are, however, a few issues with, the, with needing to maintain a high vacuum. First, it's very strenuous on the facility to have a high-powered vacuum generator for many different instruments. Also, several samples aren't content being in a high vacuum. The ones that come to mind are... Uh, aerogels, hydrogels, and biologicals. Things that would collapse if the pressure keeping them afloat isn't there. And so it became very difficult to study these types of systems using SEM. So a technique was developed known as ESEM, or Environmental Scanning Electron Microscopy, to help address this. In ESEM, the chamber that the sample is kept in is not under high vacuum, rather low vacuum, and in some cases even humid conditions. This does negatively impact both the resolving power and the uh, surface sensitivity of the image, but you can use it to study novel systems. Another interesting type of experiment that can be done with an SEM is electron dispersive spectroscopy, or EDX or EDS. And in this case, you can identify the distribution of elements in a sample. This is done because the accelerating voltage used to emit the electrons is capable of ejecting inner shell, elect inner shell electrons um, from the atoms that they hit. And since all of these electrons come off with very characteristic energies, if a detector is properly equipped, it can detect from which point in space an electron belonging to a certain parent atom was sent. Doing this technique is often used in material science to be able to study um, the dispersity of certain defects that might have been put there on purpose. The last piece of instrumentation I want to cover is the grid. As mentioned previously, the grid is what allows our sample to interface with the SEM. A grid consists of a copper grid of a certain mesh size coated with a thin layer of carbon and sometimes a thicker layer of form bar, which is a structurally supportive polymer. Our sample will sit on top of the carbon layer and hopefully in between the supporting structure of the grid. Then, when we look at our sample through the microscope, the probing electrons have very little interaction with the carbon layer, greatly reducing the background of our image. The lower the accelerating voltage is, however, the lower the ability of the electrons to penetrate through and past that carbon layer, and the more signal that our background gives. A supportive layer of form bar may be present for larger samples, but it will increase the background. 
Now that we know about how the instrument works, let's run a sample. So the first thing that we need to do is load our sample into the instrument. In order to do this, we have to put our grid in a special sample holder that can slide into the vacuum chamber. Let's watch as I definitely don't screw this up and do multiple takes. Wow, amazing job, me. All right, now that our sample is in position, let's turn on the vacuum and get searching. So similarly to optical microscopy, we need to spend some time searching for our actual sample. If we made our solution properly dilute, there should be no more than a few hundred nanoparticles spread out on this grid. So they might take a little bit of time to find, but hopefully they're there. Ah, victory! We have found our nanoparticles. Once we've found our sample, we need to make sure that the instrument is properly set up to give us a good image. So, we're going to spend a little bit of time making sure that the alignment and the stigmators are properly corrected in order to get a stable electron beam in order to get the best image that we can. Q elevator music. And now that our sample is prepared and it's been loaded into the instrument and we've corrected for everything, we can finally take a picture. So let's do that. And what is this crappy image? So, why, after all that work, did we get a crappy image? So let's think about what is happening in this instrument. So the electrons are being emitted under some accelerating voltage, and they're smacking into our sample and scattering off. However, what happens if they're not able to scatter? Where do they go? Well, it turns out that they actually just ionize our sample. and in that case, which is what happened here, um, we refer to this sample as charging. Um, we call it that because it essentially is being ionized. We are adding electrons onto our surface. And this often happens if your sample is non-conducting or weakly semiconducting. You see, a strongly conductive material can simply allow the electrons to diffuse through the material and go to areas of low energy. However, non-conducting materials, the electrons are trapped at certain peaks in the material, especially near the top. And these electrons will eventually bleed off while you're trying to collect the other scattered electrons and result in a poor image. It can be so bad to the point where a heavily charged sample will actually reflect the electron beam because the incoming negatively charged electrons do not want to touch the negatively ionized surface. And you will get patterns that look like this, that kind of just look like nonsense. In order to prevent charging in a non-conducting sample, um, we apply a thin coating of gold or conductive carbon to our material. Uh, this process is called sputtering, and it's very common on larger samples, those that have interesting features on the order of microns rather than nano. Um, and this is because that, that thin layer that we sputter on is often in that 10 nanometer size regime. So if your sample features are smaller than that, or even, even a little bit bigger, they will get diluted by this kind of thin layer of gold that you put over your sample. Another factor that can negatively impact image quality is the relation between accelerating voltage and the size of the feature you are trying to image. As mentioned previously, accelerating voltages between 1 kV and 30 kV are common in SEM. The general rule is that the higher the accelerating voltage, the stronger the resolving power. But this comes at the cost of surface sensitivity. High accelerating voltage electrons are able to more deeply penetrate the sample, causing interesting nano-sized features on the surface to be lost. However, 
Choosing an accelerating voltage that is too low can cause scattering off of non-sample contaminants in the vacuum chamber, as well as stronger background signals and less resolving power. Typically, you want to use the lowest accelerating voltage possible while maintaining a crisp image. So, with proper sample technique and a little bit of playing around at the instrument, you're able to get high quality images of nanoscale features. I would implore you to keep SEM in mind as you consider projects in the next term. In the course in previous years, we have used SEM and ESEM to a significant degree. Last year alone, um, I was involved with a few of the projects, taking pictures of leaf stomata, chemically modified sponges, and nanoparticles used to coat certain brass instruments. All of this is possible with an SEM in this course. It just depends on the projects you make. Thank you for listening to this, the only Chem 327 introduction to electron microscopy. If you have any other questions, you can feel free to email me or Nick or even Google. Good luck. See everybody next term.